Hello everyone, welcome to my channel Mukesh English. In today's video, I'm going to discuss about a famous poem, Freedom, by a Nobel laureate, Rabindranath Tagore. Rabindranath Tagore was a polymath poet, philosopher, musician, writer, and educationist. He became the first Asian to win the Nobel Prize in 1913 for his collection of poems, Gitanjali. He was called Gurudev, Kavi Guru, Vishwa Kavi, affectionately. His songs are known as Ravindra Sangeet. He was interested in the common people and worked for social reforms in addition to his literary activities. He also participated in the Indian nationalist movement. He became the voice of India's spiritual heritage to the rest of the world and a great living institution in India. In the poem Freedom, through his non-sentimental and visionary approach, Tagore mentions the need for freedom to begin from each and every individual heart and then it could be felt in the pairs. Freedom is a patriotic poem by Tagore. In this poem, he expresses his hopes and vision for his motherland, India. He is the outspoken supporter of Indian independence from Britain and wanted the end of the British Raj which is the theme of the poem, Freedom. In this poem, Tagore talks about four types of freedom which are necessary for the well-being of India. The first one is freedom from fear. Second one is freedom from the passive state of, a, of our homeland. And the third one is freedom from the anarchy of destiny. And the last one is freedom from the insulting world of puppets. The poem begins, Freedom from fear is the freedom I claim for you my motherland, freedom from the burden of the ages, bending your head, breaking your back, blinding your eyes to the beckoning call of the future, freedom from the shackles of slumber herewith. You fasten yourself in night's stillness, mistrusting the star that speaks of truth's adventurous paths. In the first two lines, Tagore says that fear is the most dangerous thing all Indians have to get rid of that. Real freedom is the freedom from fear. Fear always limits freedom. In the second line, Tagore uses the phrase motherland to signify India. These two lines express his desire to get India freedom from fear. The third line expresses his second wish that helps Indians to have a bright future. He says that all Indians have to get freedom from all senseless, illogical, orthodox beliefs and traditions. In front of British colonial rule, Indians are inactive. We considered Britishers as ideal and they came to India to educate and civilize us. We considered them as masters and obeyed everything that was imposed on us without any resistance. Tagore wanted to break such attitude towards Britishers and start a new era where Indians can enjoy the freedom Tagore did not want to bend our heads in front of the British masters. We have our own traditions and conventions to follow. In the next two lines, Tagore says that we are inactive under British rule. All Indians have to be awakened from the sleeping. Time has come to stand for our freedom. The country disrupts the star that speaks of truth's adventurous paths, which means to say that which means to say that it does not want to look around in its dark time. We need to imagine a bright future for itself in the, as an independent country. The poet continues, Freedom from the anarchy of destiny, whose sails are weakly yielded to the blind uncertain winds, and the helm to a hand ever rigid and cold as death. Freedom from the insult of dwelling in a puppet's world, where movements are started through brainless wires, repeated through mindless habits, where figures wait with patience and obedience for the master of show to be stirred into, a mem into mimicry of life. So here, Tagore says that we have to get freedom from the anarchy of destiny. It is meaningless to criticize everything for destiny. Under the British Raj, India had to lead meaningless lives. Therefore, Tagore says that we have to lead a meaningful life by fixing our own aims and objectives. We are not sailors 
who sail based on the blind uncertain wind we have our own destiny we have our, our own aims and objective another thing tagore says is that we indians should get freedom from the insulting world of puppets tagore compares indian life with a puppet show whereas very things are controlled by the master same way everything is controlled by britishers we just obey the instructions given by the british administrators in a puppet show the moment of the puppet is decided by the brainless wires held in the hands of the puppet master all the puppets look more obedient and act or move only based on the moment of wires held in the hand, in the fingers of the master this is a kind of mimicry of life same way the indian administration and culture are being controlled by the british masters and we are forced to follow it so tagore wishes his motherland to be able to live freely and making her own decisions and shaping her own destiny in this poem the famous indian poet rabindranath tagore expresses his wishes and vision for his motherland india the first wish he has for india is the wish of freedom from fear he believes fear of his countrymen is responsible for her plight of slavery the second wish he has for his motherland is the freedom from the burden of senseless illogical and orthodox beliefs and traditions which don't let her to see the future his third wish for india is to break free of her fear of taking risk he wants her motherland to dare to walk on the adventurous paths he also wants her not to trust so much in the uncertain destiny nor allow the control of a forward movement in the hands of the narrow minded and heartless people his last wish for the motherland is the freedom from humiliation of living as a slave in the hands of foreign invaders he wants her to stop living like a puppet whose each whose each and every moment is governed and controlled by the master of the show he... hello everyone welcome to my youtube channel mukesh english gone are the days when the business world used to be referred as a male dominated industry and the thought of a woman starting her own venture was treated as a taboo but today women are providing the metal in almost every sphere of life from food to fashion one can see women entrepreneurs making the mark in every field in this video we will discuss the inspiring journey of one such woman meena bindra the founder of indian fashion brand biba Meena is the perfect example of never give up spirit as even without the professional training or any past experience in the clothing business she reached the pinnacle of success you want to know how well watch further meena bintra grew up in a large family of six siblings three brothers and three sisters meena's father was a businessman but he passed away when she was only 9 years old however he left behind a lot of property so her mother was able to provide and give them a normal childhood after completing b in history from miranda house meena got married her husband was in the indian navy so as a navy wife she was able to move around the country from delhi to bombay bombay to visakhapatnam never more than 3 years in one place only when her kids had grown up did meena think of doing something So what Meena did enjoy was designing clothes. She had not done any formal course, but she experimented with the prints and colors. She got a few of her sarees block printed just for the sake of fun. She arranged for a loan from Syndicate Bank to start new business for rupees eight thousand. That was not a lot of money, but enough to buy some fabric and hire a tailor. But as they say, fortune favors the brave. She was introduced to a block printer. called devesh and he he had a big factory every morning meena would take a cab to the factory and spend the day there experimenting with various techniques and color combinations through trial and error meena put together 40 salwar suits all casual wear and reasonably priced that's under 200 rupees so some stitched and some unstitched 
This first sale resulted in a small profit of rupees three thousand. With that money, Meena bought fabric for eighty suits, and that too sold out quickly. It was a business, and yet not strictly business. She was living in a huge house. It was not a commercial venture. Purely by word of mouth, Meena's suits became famous among ladies in the Koba in the Kolaba and. Cuff parade areas of Bombay. By the end of the day, by the end of the year, she had three tailors doing job work and started getting inquiries from retailers like Benzo and Sheetal. She gave a name Biba to her new bill book. Retailers placed large orders, hundred pieces at a time, and they wanted new designs and a wider range of fabric. From a time pass and hobby venture. Biba was quickly becoming a real business, driven by a force bigger than the creator herself. Without any marketing, new shops were opening. Thousands quickly did become lakhs because in 1986, three years into business, Mina moved into a 1,000 square foot office at Camps Corner, an office which was paid for entirely by money earned from Biba. Things might have continued in this happy-go-lucky manner, except that around this time, Meena's elder son Sanjay, who completed his B.Com and joined this business, he got into Biba full time, and he proved to be big asset. Sanjay quickly took over the boring side of the business, that is, handling the labor, taking orders, keeping accounts. Now Meena could easily focus completely on designing the clothes. The next few years. Biba grew at a very fast pace. More range, more outlets, not just in Bombay, but all over India. Retailers from Bangalore and Jaipur came and placed orders. By 1993, Biba had become one of India's India's largest ethnic wear wholesalers, selling 1,000 to 2,000 pieces every month. There was money in the business, but it was not the main driving force. Meanwhile, there were other forces acting in Meena's favor. By the mid of nineties, India's first multi-city department store, Shopper Stop, came into existence. They too came to Biba for ladies' ethnic wear. In the process, Meena learned many lessons. Meena says, "We were forced to become more professional, to stand by our commitments, deliver on time, and also bring our costs down without compromising on quality." advanced planning control systems and quality checks helped the tailors become more efficient sanjay handled most of this work very efficiently in 1993 biba had around 10 employees and worked with around 100 tailors scaling up to meet the demand was a big challenge was still prevailing working with limitations and yet going beyond limits is a true test of any entrepreneur and biba passed the test with flying colors by the year 2000 production had scaled up to 5000 pieces every month demand was never an issue as as the shopper stop and then pantaloons open new outlets they needed more and more stocks while tailors expected to be paid in cash the stores expected credit but the credit period was about 30 to 45 days and there was generally no delay so biba could manage its cash flows without bank limits or overdrafts the turning point for biba came when her younger son siddharth joined the company after graduating from harvard in 2002 although by then biba had a wide footprint and annual revenues of over rupees 25 crores it was not a well known brand name siddharth had a very clear vision that is We must have our own retail outlets. Biba opened its first company-owned outlet in 2004 in Orbit and in CR2 malls in Mumbai. Both the shops did remarkably well from day one, with the sales of rupees 12 to 15 lakhs per month. Meena Bindra says here that encouraged us, and we started booking shops wherever we thought a good mall is coming up automatically. We get footfalls. In March 2012, Biba's annual revenue stood up, rupees three three hundred crores, with ninety company-owned outlets. 
contributing 50% of sales. The company continues to outsource manufacturing but employs around 1,000 people in supervisory roles and also for the retail sales. The problem Meena faced was that her husband had a transferable job. When he was posted to Delhi, she stayed back in Bombay and he was always supportive. Meena's deep and continuing commitment, commitment is towards great design. She says, I rely on my own sensibilities, simple, elegant, wearable design. She feels working with family has been a blessing because you can trust them and whatever you are building, you are ultimately doing it with and for your family. Energy is the force that moves mountains and working mothers. She says, I do yoga, pranayama, walking, swimming to keep my energy up. Since its launch, Biba has seen an immense growth in the clothing industry. The company has more than 180 brand outlets across 76 cities of India and 275 multi-brand outlets. The annual turnover of Biba is estimated at rupees 600 crores. In 2015, Biba won the best our best woman ethnic wear brand of the year at CMAI Apex Awards. Last but not the least, Meena Bindra's story of success is a subtle reminder of how one should never underestimate their potential and always be prepared to take the leap of faith. You never know what the future holds. All things bright and beautiful, all pleasures, great and small, a woman can be a wife, a mother, and an entrepreneur, live a dream, and have it all. Thank you so much for watching this motivational story. I would like to say, Koi bhi lakshya manushya ke sahas se bada nahi, hara wahi jo lada nahi. So dear friends, thoda subscribe, thoda like, thoda share. Please do subscribe, like, and share the video. Thank you once again. Hello dear friends, welcome to my channel Mukesh English. In today's video, I am going to discuss the famous poem Endymion, A Thing of Beauty is a Joy Forever by famous poet John Keats. John Keats was born on, th on 31st October 1795 and passed away on 23rd February 1821. He was an English romantic poet who devoted his short life to the perfection of a poetry marked by vivid imagery, great sensuous appeal, and an attempt to express a philosophy through classical legend. Keats focused his, his writerly attention on understanding and exploring beauty. For Keats, all things possessed potential beauty, and it was his job as a poet to find this beauty and capture it in his poetry. For John Keats, identifying and understanding that which is beautiful allows one to become more acquainted with the truth. Introduction of the poem In Greek mythology, Endymion is a beautiful young shepherd who got charmed by the vision of Cynthia, the moon goddess. He was so enormed, he was so impressed by the goddess Cynthia that he decided to wander away through the forest to seek her. Keats wrote this poem, Endymion, a poetic romance on the basis of this mythology. A thing of beauty is a joy forever. Its loveliness increases. It will never pass into nothingness, but will keep a bower quite for us and a sleep full of sweet dreams and health and quiet breathing. Keats commences the poem by saying that a beautiful thing is a source of joy till eternity. The poem continues to say that the beauty of a thing never fades away, rather it goes on enhancing with the passage of time. The poet then says that a thing of beauty is like a shady, leafy shelter, which ensures that everyone gets, lo everyone gets lost in a slumber full of sweet dreams and everyone remains healthy and calm. Therefore, on every morrow are we reading a flowery band to bind us to the earth, spite of despondence of the inhuman dearth, of noble nature, of the gloomy days, of all the unhealthy and over-darkened ways, made for our searching, yes, in spite of all, some shape of beauty moves away the pearl 
from our dark spirits. The poet continues to say that without the beautiful natural things around us, the earth would simply become a despondent place for us and we would be entangled in the clutches of misery with no scope of getting rescued. Human beings often go through innumerable challenges and, and obstacles in their lives, which make their lives overshadowed by the darkness. The only source of light for human beings amid us the darkness is the beauty of natural things that surround them. Therefore, the dark spirits of human beings are illuminated with light through the beauty of natural things that are present on the earth. Human beings engage themselves in reading beautiful bands from flowers and leaves that fill them with ecstasy and keep them connected to the earth even after the miserable experiences on earth. Such the sun, the moon, trees old and young, sprouting a shade of bone for simple sheep and such a daffodils with the green world they live in, clear rills that for themselves a cooling covert make against the hot season the mid-forest break. The poet begins to point out the, to the various beautiful things that are present in nature, like sun, moon, the trees that provide the comfort of shade to all the living beings, the daffodils that emanate beauty through their brilliant yellow color and the green stems and the clear streams of water that make their way through the forest and create an atmosphere of coolness in hot summers. By pointing to all these elements of nature, the poet is asserting on the fact that human beings and in fact all the living beings are bestowed with abundant blessings and therefore we should be grateful for these natural blessings. Moreover, the poet compares human beings to simple sheep in order to sympathize with the innocence of human beings who ultimately seek solace in nature and overcome their miseries. Rich with a sprinkling of fair musk rose blooms and such too is the grandeur of the dooms we have imagined for the mighty dead all lovely tales that we have heard or read an endless fountain of immortal drink pouring unto us from the heaven's brink. The poet further continues to describe the beauty of other elements of nature, like the fair musk roses that bloom with an amazing fragrance that sprinkles all around them. Moreover, he also advocates the beauty in the death of martyrs, who sacrificed their lives for the greater good of humanity, all the lovely tales of sacrifice of the martyrs that are either read or heard by the human beings are also marked as a beauty of as a thing of beauty by the poet. The poet displays his commendable craftsmanship by the way he concludes the poem. Throughout the closure of the poem, he says that if human beings keenly look around the abundant blessings that are bestowed upon them by the Almighty, then they will feel that all the blessings seem to be poured upon them as an immortal, endless fountain from the heaven's edge. The poem reflects two important thematic views, nature as an eternal antidote to human miseries. Through this poem, the poet has advocated that the various elements of nature, like the sun, the moon, the beautiful flowers, the clear streams of water, the fair musk roses, etc., they all serve as an antidote to the human miseries, to the miseries of human beings. It is through these elements of nature that human beings become empowered enough to not be adversely affected by the complexities of their lives. The grandeur of the mighty dead. The poet also glorifies the sacrifices of the mighty dead and advocates that the tales of bravery serve as a source of inspiration for everyone. Human beings therefore consider the mighty dead as a benchmark of courage and they seek both ecstasy as well as inspiration by listening or reading to their stories of bravery. Hello everyone, welcome to my YouTube channel Mukesh English. In this video, I'm going to talk about a very important motivational story, The Happy Prince by Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde was an Anglo-Irish playwright, novelist, poet and critic. 
He is regarded as one of the greatest playwrights of the Victorian era. In his lifetime, he wrote nine plays, one novel, and numerous poems, short stories. It is about the story of a statue of the Happy Prince, covered with gold and many fine jewels. It sits overlooking the city. One day, a swallow, a little bird, seeks shelter under the statue and discovers the prince not happy but sad. The bird becomes friendly with the prince and tries to make him happy by assisting him in his desires to ease the sufferings of others. It plucks out the ruby, the sapphire, and other fine jewels from the statue and delivers them to those who are poor and needy. This story talks about social injustice, power of love, and loss of innocence. <clears throat> In this story, we come across a statue who at one time a real prince. When the prince was alive, he was a happy person. He lived in the palace and did not know about human suffering. His life was full of joys. Upon his death, his statue was built at the top of a tall column in the city. The statue was covered all over with thin leaves of fine gold. For eyes, he had two bright sapphires and a large red ruby glowed on his sword hilt, that is, Handel. The statue of the happy prince looked beautiful, and everyone in the city loved to see the prince. Since he was placed high above the city on a tall column, the prince was able to witness all the sorrows and sufferings which the common people faced in the daily life. But the prince remained ignorant of them during his lifetime. This made the prince, once happy, very sad. His eyes got watered and large drops of tears began to run down his golden cheeks. A little swallow, the little swallow bird, who had alighted between the feet of the happy prince to spend the night there, became curious to know where did the drops of water fall from. He looked up and saw the eyes of the happy prince full of tears. The bird took pity on the prince and became ready to assist him in his desire to ease the sufferings of the common people. He became the messenger of the prince and agreed to remove the fine gold and jewels from the statue to distribute them among the poor. And the, the bird started with plucking the ruby from the prince's ward and giving it to the seamstress who had no money to feed her ailing child. Then he plucked a sapphire from one of the eyes of the statue and, give, and gave it to the playwright who was too poor to make fire in the winter to continue his writing. He was also very hungry and feeling weak. One day, the prince saw a match girl who was being beaten by her father for letting her matches fall in the gutter. The prince's heart filled with pity for the girl he immediately commanded the swallow to pluck out the other eye and help the girl. But the swallow bird was not, was not ready to do so because this would make the prince completely blind. On being insisted, he plucked out the prince's other eye, swooped past the match girl and slipped the jewel into the palm of her hand. The little bird decided not to leave the company of the happy prince who had gone blind now. Now the prince has no eyes to see the sufferings or the sorrows of his people, so he instructed the bird to take off the fine gold he was covered with and give it to the people. The bird followed his words, picked off leaf after leaf of the gold till the happy prince looked quite dull and grey. Then the snow came and the poor little swallow grew older and colder, but he did not leave the prince. Eventually. He grew weak and died from exposure. Just at that moment, a curious crack sounded inside the statue as if something had broken. It was in fact the leaden heart that had snapped right into two at the loss of the sweet and kind swallow bird. The statue was no more beautiful and useful. It stood deserted. So the town councillors and the mayor pulled it down. Then they melted the statue into a, in a furnace. But the broken heart did not melt. So 
they threw it on a dust heap where the dead swallow was lying. When God asked one of his angels to bring the two most precious things in the city, the angel brought him the leaden heart, leaden heart and the dead bird. God welcomed the two in his garden of paradise and deemed them as the beautiful creations. The story Happy Prince is a story of prince and a little swallow bird. It highlights that love and sacrifice are important aspects in human life. Hence, disparity and sorrow in society can be overcome by compassion, generosity and sharing. The generous prince and the gentle swallow bird sacrificed themselves to bring happiness to the poor and needy people. The moral of the story is that humans should do good and help those in need. The prince and the swallow help others who are suffering and they die in this process. However, they are rewarded in the afterlife. <clears throat> Hello dear friends, welcome to my YouTube channel Mukesh English. In today's video, I'm going to discuss the famous poem The Sundar Buns, written by Sushil Mandal, uh, the famous Bengali poet. This poem is translated from Bengali to English by Shishir Roy. What are Sundarbans? The Sundarbans is a mangrove area in the delta formed by the confluence of the Ganges, Brahmaputra and Meghna rivers in the Bay of Bengal. It comprises closed and open mangrove forest, agricultural used land, mud flats and barren land and it is intersected by multiple tidal streams and channels. The poem Sundarban is about the difficulties faced by the indigenous communities of Sundarbans. Their life is well connected with the wildlife. They solely depend on the forest for their survival. This poem is in the form of monologue where the poet highlights the plight of the downtrodden. The poem begins, You coming from Kolkata, sir, who sends you here? All come to see the tigers, but no takers for us. A lot more things for you here. Tigers, crocodile, hental, sundari trees, the mangrove. You write poetry on the colorful leaves. Only we, black bodies, are left unnoticed. Our children, poor scavengers, scuffle with the orange peels you have thrown. Tigers fascinate you. No, the Royal Bengal. The speaker is questioning the tourist, asking him where he's from, who sent him at Sundarbans why he has come to Sundarbans. The speaker then responds that everyone comes to see the tigers, especially Royal Bengal tigers, but no one cares about the people or their problems. The speaker then takes on the role of a tourist guide. He describes the beauty of nature, the world famous Royal Bengal tigers, crocodiles and the various trees of the mangrove forest like Hental, Sundari, the tone and the tone and the mood of the poem changes here. The speaker compares and contrasts the plight of the people of Sundarbans. The tourists write about the colorful leaves, the beauty of nature and so on, but they turn a blind eye to the people of Sundarbans, where the black bodies are unnoticed, especially the Dalits. Their children are scavengers. They literally fight for food. This demonstrates the children's pitiful living conditions, which include a lack of food and education, and these children are struggling to feed themselves. <clears throat> how wonderful, oh, how is it possible? You never know the secret behind the man-eater guzzled a lot. Haripada, Subal, Fateh Ali, how many shall I count? Subal's wife hanged herself last year, couldn't bear the fangs of hunger, fangs of hunger, what we could do. The speaker asks a rhetorical question once more, once again, and he says that the Royal Bengal tiger fascinate him, but he's unaware of the secret behind them. The tigers, which are very popular and bring brings a large number of tourists every year, they are the same tigers. But these tigers, they kill a large number of people every year. Haripada, Subal, Fateh Ali, and many other people have been killed by the, main, uh, by the man eaters. Worst of all, Subal's wife committed suicide by hanging herself because she felt helpless without a husband. 
she was dependent on her husband and after the tiger killed him she was unable to fend for herself and she died of the starvation the speaker expresses the helplessness asking what could we do we wait for the minister to come he came once year ago promised the sundar bonds will transform we beg you sir go tell him kindly our stomachs are full with the brine water from flood the speaker declares that they are powerless and all they can do just to wait for the minister who has visited sundarbans only once in the previous year and especially during the election season during his visit the minister as usual he made the false promises declaring that sundarbans will transform however nothing has changed and the people of the sundarbans are still being killed by the tigers and they are facing the natural disasters such as cyclones and the floods the speaker literally begs the tourists to deliver the message to the minister saying our stomachs are full with the brine water from the flood the the poet is very sarcastic here he says that their stomachs are full of salt water from the flood this satirical statement describes the the horrible condition that the people of sundarbans are living in without food and constant floods which are submerging the lands and lot of loss of lives they are witnessing in nutshell we can say that this poem depicts the dreadful living conditions of the dalits in the far corners of the marshland that is sundarban it also speaks about the struggle between man and nature where how the people how the people of sundarbans facing difficulties especially in the time of cyclones and the flood so the government needs to pay attention towards the difficulties of these people and this poem serves as a medium to draw the attention of the government
dear friends thank you so much for watching this video for more videos don't forget to subscribe and comment for online classes you can contact me on 63616176669 or you can mail me mukesh english@gmail.com thank you once again